analyze ideas coming from the Buddha about life, happiness, suffering, the human mind. Why? Listen, so we can take it as advice if we wish. Advice, it is advice, and advice to help us put ourselves together, to help us navigate lives, become you know more clear, less neurotic, less up and down, more stable, therefore more content, therefore more empathetic, more connected to others, more useful on this planet. Speaking very simply, thinking we're here together to do that. Sange Chodang Soke Tognam La Jancho Badu Jagni Kyapsuchi Dagi Chernian Gipesonam Ki Drola Penche Sange Drupa Shok Sange Chodang Soke Tognam La Jancho Badu Jagni Kyapsuchi Dagi Chernian Gipesonam Ki Drola Penche Sange Drupa Shok Sange Charam, Soke Chagnam La, Chang Chu Badu Jagni Kapsuchi, Dagi Chernian Gipesonam Ki, Drola Penche Sange Drupa Shok. So. I don't know. What do you think, Eileen? What should we talk about? Good. I'm sure you have. She's always got a question. You can rely on Eileen. I do, have a question. I do have a question, actually. From from last week on refuge. Yeah, please. Be as loud as possible. Can you put it louder there? No. Hang on a second. Just can't get louder here. Go on, darling. Talk. Uh, you talked about absolute Buddha, relative Buddha, absolute Dharma, relative Dharma. It's as loud as possible here. The volume there doesn't do any good. No, she has to be one good. There's nothing, it can't get louder here. Yeah. Hang on a sec, Eileen. Um, What's the solution? Yeah, I, all I know is that volume. What? All I know is the volume. It's up here, darling. It's I know, and you did it. There yeah, it exactly. Um, and you, I'm on, and you're yeah, muted. It's them, but we're talking about them. Yep, yep. So never mind, just do your best yeah, to talk loud, Eileen. Go on, darling. She's Thank fine. you. She Thanks for um, uh, on, last week you mentioned uh, absolute Buddha, relative Buddha, absolute Dharma, relative Dharma. Yeah, right. Could could you, Rabina, be cut? Just I I think I wrote down something that relative Dharma would be this the the Buddha's speech, his teachings. That's right. And so, what would absolute Dharma be then? The knowledge in the mind of the Buddha. Can oh, I that? see. What? Could you repeat the question so people hear? Pretty I know it's a bit ridiculous. Can we can't make the volume louder? Know? Do you understand, Eileen? That's it. You you understand? Yes, that absolute dharma is the knowledge in the mind of the Buddha, and the relative dharma. That's is right. It's the, the words. Things. That's right. But absolute Buddha is coming from here, is it? Or is it coming from there? Hang on a sec, sweetie. Really? Is it coming from that thing? No. no. What's that thing for? Is, uh, What's it for? Like, is anybody here familiar with? Uh, to make it louder, yeah. To, we want to increase the volume on on Venerable's uh, computer. So, so you where does it hear the people on Zoom? Yeah, usually we can hear them. Yeah. What? They're asking me if I can help. Well, there's nothing to do. Look, the volume is top. Is See, there, there you go. May I try one more thing? What else is there? Well, sometimes there's this and volume like as well for the other book. people. Oh, uh, no, sure. but we can try. We can try the. Could the projector, does the projector have a uh, sound system? Maybe she can speaking again. So talk now, Arlene. Uh, so absolute Buddha, relative Buddha. That's one there. That's one there, though. That's a bit yeah. gigantic, isn't it? Never mind. It's better than nothing. Thank you, darling. So relative Buddha would be the Buddha as a, the teaching, the teacher. Well, Mr. Shakyamuni. Shakyamuni. And at, what is absolute Buddha? The mind of Buddha. The mind. Oh, okay. Just the mind. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I okay, do. Darling. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good, sweetheart. So, okay. So, do you have any questions for today besides that, Eileen? No, I, I, did, I did have a question. I, I, It's about the law of karma. 
What about Carmen? What's the question, darling? Well, the question is um, I, that our individual, but karma is very individual. Oh, here, see if it works. Go on. Karma is very individual. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've got it. I've got it. Uh, Go. Karma is individual. It cannot be shared. Is that right? Oh, tell me what you mean by those words. Break, well, break them down into ordinary English. Uh, well, I'm trying. It, we're interdependent, so relationships. So, a, a child, for instance, loses a parent early in life. The, the mother or father died early, or it could be something good. Your partner wins the lottery, but the person you're with, or the circumstances that you experience, is your personal karma. But it's through these other people. Speak it in ordinary. I don't know what you and I, I sort of can hear what you're saying, Eileen, but it, it just sounds very just speak it in ordinary English words. What uh, do you think karma means for a start? What are you talking about? What do you mean? What do you think it means here? What are you saying? Keep it really simple. Uh, the, the karmic seeds that I have accumulated throughout lifetimes. And what do you think that means? Speak in ordinary terms. What's in my mind? Yeah, what's in your mind. So therefore, what's in your mind is what you put in your mind. Would you agree with that? Yes, yes. So therefore, the question would be, what's the question, therefore? That answers your question, doesn't it? It does. Doesn't so, it? so you're saying it's, it's, a, it's, well, not that it's irrelevant, but what we experience through other people. But we, we live lives with other people. It's how yeah. we are, isn't it? Yes, yes. So therefore, the question is? Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Do we, is there some kind of, uh contract we make ahead of time that you'll have to... <laughs> i'm trying to understand i understand eileen it's all right I... darling listen i'll just give you the summary you've heard it four million times yes I know. okay we'll just talk about it. now that you've opened up the topic why not discuss it okay i'll just discuss it eileen you can, you can go relax now put your thing off and relax thank you darling Okay, I mean, it's a word that's, I mean, you can see, you know, it's a word that's thrown around a million times by a million people with a million different meanings. But basically, as the Dalai Lama says, karma is like self-creation. It's the way to put it. The crucial point about the Buddhist view, you know, if we think of religious philosophy, which it is, we tend to think of religious philosophy coming from a creator or assuming a creator. That's the view of religious philosophy, it seems like. Almost like default assumption, isn't it? That it's a creator philosophy. Well, no such concept like that in Buddhism. The Buddhist view is we basically create ourselves. It's a simple way of putting it. So basically, answering Eileen's question, the Buddhist view is very simply in that every millisecond of what anybody thinks and does and says, basically, programs the mind. It's the simplest way to put it. Programs the mind. The, I mean, the Buddha doesn't talk about programming, obviously. You talk about sowing seeds in the mind. They use the analogy of seeds and fruit. But programming the mind is a really good way to put it. I mean, you think and do and say programs you, turns you into the person you become. I mean, the, the words even seem almost too simple, but actually they're quite shocking when we think, when we realize the meaning of this. Because it's not how we think now. We know it when it comes to playing music, becoming a mathematician. We know that whatever we think and do and say in relation to music is the process that produces the musician. We know that. We don't say it that way, but we know that's true. But we do not think that whatever I think and do and say in relation to ethics and goodness and badness and love and anger and compassion is, is what produces the person I become. That's very shocking to us. We don't think that. That's the Buddha's view, essentially. So that's the first point, Eileen, that whatever you think and do and say one way karma ripens is in, is in terms of the person you become. And so, of course, the long, long time, the long term view Buddha has, which sounds pretty abstract for us, it even produces the person you become after you die. You program your mind such that you produce a future life. Sounds pretty abstract. And that also implies it produces the kind of the tendencies in your mind. One of the ways your karma ripens, using the seed, the analogy of seeds, is that whatever you think and do and say, see, so seeds in the mind that ripen in the future, one, as a type of person you become, meaning a type of rebirth, but two, simply the tendencies in your mind, which is, again, hardly surprising. If you play piano all day, don't be surprised you're good at playing piano. If you get angry all day, don't be surprised you become an angry person, that you have a tendency to be angry. I mean, again, that surprises us, but it's completely logical. But the third way is what you're referring to, Eileen, 
the karma ripens because we are very social beings, aren't we? We're very social beings. We get born in a human mind, in a human body. We have mummies and daddies and siblings and aunties and uncles and grandpas and friends and enemies and strangers on this planet. We live intensely in relation to others. So it's obvious that whatever we think and do and say plays out in relation to others. So don't be surprised that causes you to create a karmic connection with those people and you experience things similar to that from others. So that's your answer. That's the answer there, Eileen. So one, karma ripens as a type of rebirth. Two, type ripens in terms of your tendencies. Three, ripens in terms of your experiences at the hands of others based on the karma you created. And four, even more subtly, ripens in terms of the way the very physical world impacts upon us. These are the four ways karma ripens, Eileen. One, a rebirth. Two, tendencies. Three, experiences. And four, environment. Do you understand, Eileen? That's the essence of the answer, darling. You unpack it like taking those four points. You understand? So, of course, um, yeah, I mean, this is not how we think in the world. We know the arts. You know, the Buddha's not saying the arts. Okay, when he says that whatever we think and do and say produces the person we become and is the main cause of what we experience, he's not saying the outside world doesn't play a role. So you can't argue that, that if a person is kind to you, it's one of the causes of you being happy. Or if a person's mean to you, it's one of the causes of you not being happy. We can see that. But in the in our world, we tend to think they're the main causes. You know, my happiness comes from the outside. My suffering comes from the outside. And the thing that Buddhism factors in is the, the role of your mind. I mean, the words are simple enough, but it's, um, yeah, it's not how we tend to think. I mean, the very fact that we can, you know, you can say, if you sit there in your house playing piano all day and no one hears you, you know that whatever you play, will produce the person, the musician you become. You don't need people to see you play good music for you to play good music. Or you don't need a person to hear you play lousy music to know that if you played lousy music all day, it would produce a lousy musician. It's not surprising to us. It, we, we, we really know this, but it's very shocking to us to think that what goes on in my mind all day in my own house is so angry all day at the television and the iPad and, you know, shouting and yelling at the world why would we be surprised if you become more neurotic and more angry? I mean, why is that surprising to us? It is surprising to us because we are so addicted to wanting to find the cause on the outside and to think we're an innocent victim who's allowed to be angry. So he goes very caught up like that, you know. It's also almost like not fair to say that I produce myself. We'd rather blame the outside world for the happiness and the suffering, actually. So that's really the absolute essence of the Buddhist approach. This is the absolute essence of the Buddhist approach to, to the mind. But we are we are we, we are the main player, basically. It's the way to put it. So it's quite a powerful concept. It demands it, it, it means accountability. It, it, the more we take that on board in our lives, the more the less the less uh, victim we become, the less we blame others the less angry, the less neurotic, the less attached, because we take responsibility. We realize that whatever I think and do and say is what produces me. And we know, because I want to be happy and don't want to suffer, speaking very simply, then who in their right mind will want to be angry all day? But because we want to get ourselves off the hook, but it's not my fault, we'll say. Look what she did to me, we'll say. It's true. The world is terrible. People do terrible things to each other. You can't argue. You can't argue with that. It's a fact. We emphasize that one. And we use it as a, as a, as a thing to get off the hook, basically. It sounds pretty cruel, but it's how we are. I'm allowed to be angry, we'll say. I'm allowed to be jealous. I'm allowed to be depressed. It's got nothing to do with being allowed. So this idea of karma, it sounds simple, but it really takes a while to take on board, to realize that we're the boss, you know. And that if we want to be happy and not suffer, 
and we have to we have to we have to cause it. If you want to be a musician, you need to provide. You need to make the musician. We all get it. We get that. No problem for us. We understand it. So you get all the conditions together to produce a good musician. The key cause being your mind. It's so clear. Not when it comes to being happy and suffering. This is very fascinating. You've got to admit, it's totally fascinating to me that we see it so differently. You know, producing a happy person to be a, a musician. Same principle for the Buddha. It's exactly the same. It starts with the mind. What you what you internalize, how you think, and then you train in that. So basically, with the Buddha's views, very simply. The job of being a Buddhist, speaking simply, is to train your mind in positive thoughts and detrain your mind in negative ones. So as a musician, to detrain your mind in not knowing how to play music and to train your mind in familiarity with music. And then we all know practice makes perfect. Same here. But it's a thousand times more difficult, isn't it? The obstacles seem huge. As much as we can hear that my mind is the main player, when the bad things happen, we know they so dominate. They so dominate our lives. It's overwhelming for us. It's understandable. They loom large, you know. So then if it's true, we want to be happy, you don't want to suffer. If it's true, you want to play the play music, you better learn the theories. You better learn the musical thoughts to have. So you learn musical theory. And you familiarize your mind with them, and then you start playing the piano. So what are the theories here? Well, from Buddha's own observation, he didn't make it up. It's not revelation. He's not speculating. That's his experience. Is it um that we basically, and this is where we have to understand the Buddha's view of the mind, deceptively simple. We've got neurotic, deluded, unhappy, distorted, eye-based, fear-based states of mind that are, these, that are the source of our pain. And then we have the positive ones. So, was, so then the Buddha would suggest that over, you know, um, practicing attachment, anger, jealousy, low self-esteem, depression, anxiety, aggression, fears, you name it, we know these words intimately. Familiarity with these in our mind, programming our mind with these, is the source of my suffering now and in the future. So don't, it's not a question of punishment. It's a, it's, it's a natural process. You don't play the piano and then get rewarded by being called a good musician. Your piano playing itself produces the musician. Same here. The Buddhist view is, I mean, my Catholic mother used to say that. She said, virtue has its own rewards, she'd say. So the Buddhist idea, very simply, virtue and non-virtue, these old-fashioned words, good ethics. But a mind that practices ethics, good ethics, you know, both first mentally and then through behavior, in other words, the Buddhist view would be through your body, speech, and mind, you program, you strongly practice through your body, speech, and mind, familiarizing yourself with, you know, um, non-attachment, non-anger, non-jealousy, non-depression, kindness, love, generosity, so forth and so forth. That's the practice. That's what turning yourself into a happy person means. And then the opposite, you know. But of course, this is the hardest job we'll ever do because we can see that these are the negative ones are deeply ingrained habits. As nice as we are, we mightn't all go around killing and stealing and raping every day. But we can see how easy it is to be depressed, to be anxious, to be worried. I mean, they pervade our minds, you know. Why? Because the habits are strong. That's all. So to break these habits is not easy, but that's practice. That's practice. So the essential job, as Lama Yeshi puts it, is be your own therapist, to learn to know your own mind intimately. And that's what takes time. But the first job, as we talk often enough, I mean, the first job, which sounds so boring to us in our culture, is first control the servants of the mind, your body and your speech, your behavior, 
you know, sounds like your grandmother, behave nicely. They often say, the Buddhists would say, when you're on your, when you're with others, you control your behavior. When you're on your own, you can control your mind. When you're really advanced, you can do both together, you know. Because behavior is how is, is what impacts upon others, isn't it? Your body and speech is what impacts upon others. And if we're not controlled, if, you know, when someone says a mean word and we blurt out those words, which is so common, we know that's when it makes the mess, isn't it? So a really classical approach to practice in Buddhism is you start with your body and your speech. That's where the concept of living in vows, having precepts, having a disciplined practice every day. I mean, it sounds so boring, control your body and speech, like, oh, no, I want to meditate, please. Sure, meditate. But if your mind's, if your body's berserk, if your speech is berserk, and we don't necessarily go around raping and killing, so it's usually our speech in our daily lives, our speech is what gets us incredible trouble, isn't it? No control. It's because we have no control over our mind as well. But at least we can start with a speech, at least that. But it takes a while to hear this. In our culture, it sounds so boring to think of a spiritual practice where we control your speech. It just sounds like you're being suppressed, you know? But it's kind of profound if you can get it. It's a revelation when we can hear it. We realize the problems in our relationships, of course they come from the mind. But the speech is what does the problem. The speech is what does the trouble. When everything blurts out the speech, you know? And that's, the, that's, that's when the harm happens. So we can control our speech. It's like a miracle, if you think about it. I mean, look at our, you know, when, when you're around families and close people, speech is completely out of control. I mean, our culture is like berserk. Speech is just, I mean, look at it. Look at all the social stuff, you know, all the computers and what do you call, you know? It's all speech, really, isn't it? Uncontrolled speech. And look at the conspiracy theories on this planet. I mean, the world's an insane, insane asylum. And it's all coming from speech. We just vomit out whatever we think. Everybody, we just vomit whatever we think. We don't think speech We actually, And that's because we don't think speech matters. We don't think speech matters, meaning we don't think that what, whatever we say, and this is back to the karmic view, what is saying whatever we say, whatever we do, and therefore whatever we think, programs us. Nothing goes astray. Programming us means is this con we're involved every day in this ongoing, constant, unceasing process of producing the person I've become. It's simple words, but it's very shocking. We don't think of life like that. We think of it all in terms of external things, what we do externally. That to us seems to be what matters. You do this and you go here and you go there and you have a meal. That seems to be what life is. But just to think that what you think and say is the process that produces who you become, it's quite shocking. Because unless we're doing something, we think our life is not existing. We think we're just being boring, you know. But your thought, every thought, even that's the most shocking. If, if you count how many thoughts we must have in a day, I mean, just in one second, even in the West, I think they say it's like a thousand thoughts a second. Buddha would agree with that. The Buddhist approach is, is none of those thoughts goes astray. I mean, if you're trying to become a musician and you have a thousand musical thoughts a second, you better start controlling what thoughts they are because that will turn you into the musician you become. But if you just say, oh, I can think what I like, you can think what you like. But if you want to think, but if you want to become a musician, you've got to think musical thoughts. The thoughts have to be accurate. That's the level of clarity we have to we have to develop. So what we're trying to say here is the Buddhist view is we have millions of thoughts, and then we're going to look at them carefully. Some are eye-based, neurotic, attachment, anger, depression, low self-esteem, anxiety, you name it, not judging us. They're neurotic thoughts. They're only going to produce more misery. So if we really begin to take this on board seriously, we learn to watch our mind like a hawk because we want to be happy and don't want to suffer. It's an intense sense of responsibility to have. But because we feel, oh, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I say. Meaning it doesn't matter means it doesn't have results. 
It doesn't matter what I think about music. You know, of course it does. It produces the musician you become. So it does matter what we think and do and say. And then, of course, we get all neurotic and guilty. Oh, I'm a naughty person then. No, just miserable like the rest of us. So we have to learn. I mean, the levels to which we can learn to know our mind from the Buddhist perspective are incredibly sophisticated. The levels to which we can develop our mind are unbelievably incredible. And we have to start somewhere. So a good start is... You know, you have a little practice every day, even a few minutes. But then the, the, throughout the day, because you're with others, a major practice is learning to harness the energy of your speech. Not This is not moralistic. This is not so that you get praised or rewarded. This is your practice to produce the person you want to become. We know we can't bear having fights. We know we, once those words are out of the mouth, we feel so bad and you can't take them back. We know that. So it's a long, slow process of becoming super familiar with our mind. And here, we're of course, you can, you know, we're talking Buddha's view here. You can decide whose view you like. You can use Jung's view of the mind if you want. We're talking Buddha's here. Buddha's is this very precise presentation of the, the, the distinction between the neurotic, deluded, eye-based, fear-based ones, which are the source of our pain, and the positive ones. There are saving grace, like I like to say. So it's almost too simple to us, like negative and positive, virtuous and non-virtuous. It sounds so religious. No, it's just all to do with ethics. And it's not rocket science. When you say anger, we know what it feels like. When you say depression, when you say jealousy, we know they're painful. So the starting point in Buddhism, the starting point has to be this view. And this is not like we think in the modern world. Well, a little bit these days with our concept of neuro neuroplasticity. As one Canadian scientist said, it's the greatest finding of the 20th century. And that we're not stuck with the brain we're born with, which is a revelation for us. But as, and with respect to Mr. Buddha, he's been telling us this quietly for two and a half thousand years. That's the basis of all his practice that we're not stuck with the mind we're born with, but it's infinitely flexible. And it's our ability to become familiar with it and then distinguish the contents of it, and then learn to harness it and grow it. It's a super, super proactive um, methodology, basically. Not just victims of what's in our mind, you know. We're going to become super, super, super in charge. It takes time, but it's possible. And who'd be the beneficiary? Oneself. I mean, this technique called single-pointed concentration invented by these genius Indians more than 3,000 years ago. Inconceivable, even in, if we compare with modern, you know, neuroscientific views of the mind and the capability of the mind. You know, I remember years and years ago, at one of these co conferences, you know, among, like, with the Dalai Lama, all these conferences the Buddhists have been having with the neuroscientists and people for 30 years. I remember one of them was a discussion about how long the human mind can concentrate. And I think the fine, I don't know how they based the, the, what concentration is, but for some kind of like six seconds was considered oh, a fairly normal person, you know. But the Buddha's view, and again, before Buddha, these Indians, we've got this capability, and this is like science fiction to us, to completely subdue the mind at a grosser level altogether, completely subdue the gross conceptuality altogether, and to completely subdue the sensory consciousness altogether. Which just sounds like non-existent for us. You'd be disappeared. But they're the grosser levels of our mind, according to this view, which the Buddha takes as well. And we've got these subtler levels of mind. I mean, Lama Yeshi talks about some of the qualities we'd have in his book on Mahamudra. And so, I mean, it just sounds like science fiction to us. It's like inconceivable. And as soon as we hear things like this, we make it religious and mystical, you know. But it's talking, this is Buddhist psychology. It's, this is what the capability of the mind is. Extraordinary capability to harness the energy of the delusions, the, the, the uncontrolled ones, the, the ones that cause us misery, and the ability to develop the virtuous states of mind. This is the consequence of having control over the mind, you know. So really it's not a very complicated concept. 
to become a happy person, you develop your mind. You become, you, you develop less, you you, you de-develop, you, re, you you undevelop the neuroses and you grow and develop the virtues. That essentially is the method. It seems almost too ridiculous, too simple, you know. So we should look into it. Don't just believe it. And then, of course, it needs perseverance. But our trouble is, of course, guilt gets into it. Oh, I'm a bad person. I can't do it. It's no good. It's impossible. I'm always angry, blah, 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 blah. You know, we love to hate ourselves. So we've got to have courage to understand it and then know it's possible. And that's huge because, I mean, life is difficult. Life is tough and the mind is not easy to harness. When you know it's possible, then you can persevere, you know. So that's the essence of being a Buddhist. So you better ask me some questions now. Ask me some questions. Somebody. Mm. Mm -hmm. So this, so when you say have a little practice. Let me see you first. What, what do you what do you mean by that? Practice. Yeah, what what is a practice? Okay. I mean, yeah, there's formal ways of talking about a practice, isn't it? Of course. Um so a formal practice, usually that's what we mean by meditation. So you visualize the person with their eyes closed, sitting on a chair or cross-legged or something. That's typically Asian, isn't it? Um, uh, so I suppose you can say when you're practicing the piano, you have, you have a formal state. You have to have a piano. You have to have the theories of music in front of you. And then you practice hard in a certain period, don't you? Then, But then throughout the day, you can be thinking about it. You can be singing the tunes. But you have your formal periods of practice, don't you? Intensive. Yes. Same here, for sure. Absolutely for sure. So that would consist of, I mean, okay, if the, if the mind's uncontrolled, then what we need to learn, one of the simple techniques, there's two main kinds of meditation in Buddhism, millions of techniques two main modes of using your mind. And the first one, which is invented by these Indians 3,000 years ago, concentration, that's clearly a necessary a necessary component. Because if you can't focus on even making a cake, if you can't concentrate for more than a second, you can't even make a cake, right? So you need to have the mind going from moment to moment, focusing on what you're doing. So this classical concentration technique and it's vaguely known in the world as the variations of it known as mindfulness, right? Sure. This is a necessary one, but don't hold your breath. It's not going to get easy to get to where they say you can get just by doing it, you know, after before breakfast. But it can start. And one of the key benefits, there's all kinds of other practices, so many kinds. And as you develop, if you do develop, let's say one develops a Buddhist practice, and in different traditions that have different things, we have all kinds in the Tibetan Buddhist one. We have meditations where we have mantras, where we have visualizations, because everything you do with your mind is producing the person you become. But the concentration one, even we might get much, get much concentration, the very fact of even for five minutes making an effort to keep your mind on one thing. You anchor your mind. And a, a classical object of concentration, certainly the starting point, would be the something like the breath. Because it happens naturally, you know, it's a good example. So you'd sit down, you know, you get a conducive position, you get comfortable, you try and have a quiet spot, it would help not to have everybody else yelling and screaming. And then for just for, for a few minutes, you would make a decision, I'm going to pay attention to the breath. It's a very simple, it's like a training. And you're beginning the process of training yourself to concentrate. So, of course, you won't concentrate because the mind is berserk, but you train because you're making the effort you then you bring your mind back to that focus. And even for five minutes training like that, you don't get much concentration, but because you're familiarizing yourself with this wish to keep yourself focused, even when you get off your cushion and you go down to the kitchen, you know, you're not constant, you're not doing your formal meditation, but, but you bring you bring that skill with you. So whereas once You'd only, or like when you're driving in the car, let's say, whereas once you'd only notice you're angry when the words are vomiting out your mouth. Now, because you've been paying attention to your breath in the morning, you're training yourself to stay on one thing. You're consciously training to stay on one thing. Then you bring that to bear on in the car and you've got to, not watching your breath in the car, you'll kill yourself if you do that, but you're noticing your mind. And so before the words vomit out, you catch yourself. So you bring that skill to bear in your daily life when you gradually learn to become more conscious of what the hell is happening in this crazy mind of ours until it vomits out the mouth or until you're inert in bed one day because you can't get out because of depression. Mm -hmm. So it's learning to become familiar with this crazy head of ours, you know. Often what they say even in the classical texts, 
sometimes a sign of success is you think your mind's getting worse. It's not. It's just that you're noticing it more. So it's a slow, gradual process of training in these simple little techniques, and there's millions of others as well, but that's a good starting point, you understand? Yeah. And the wish is to learn in your day-to-day -day life, very simply, the wish is to learn to notice your thoughts before they get to the mouth, which is a good example. It's a really good way to say it, you understand? That's really hard. It is extremely hard, isn't it? I mean, mouth just is utterly spontaneous, you know? Mm -hmm. We can't believe ourselves, isn't it? It's so true. I know. Yeah. Because so, much, and so there's just a simple starting point. There's many others as well, but it's a starting point. This simple train, kind of, it's a training, basically. It's like you're trying to train to ride a bike. You get on the bike, you fall off again. You get back on again, you fall off until eventually you can stay on for maybe three seconds. So you're training yourself and you bring this training into your life where you become not so much conscious of your breath in daily life, but you can't help but become conscious because while you're watching your breath, you can't help but hear the crazy thoughts. Of course, they don't, we have a thought that you're supposed to make, they're supposed to make them all go away. That's naive. You, the goal is not to follow them. You can say that. So you're training just to watch the breath. Do you understand? Yeah. The thoughts are there, but you're training not to follow them. This is part of the process. So we just get better at this and more sophisticated at it. And then many other practices as well that you add on to all this is just a starting point. Do you understand? Yes, I do. Okay. Thank you. What else, people? So yes. Touch on the same topic. Okay. <clears throat> when you get to a certain point, you know, concentration, let's say meditation. Yes. Uh, I've heard that obviously there's a lot of different practices. Tom Lin doing, you know, meditation. Of course, course, of course, millions of uh, practices. Right, long run. When you're wanting, when you're, when you practice now for a little while, what is the best method for a daily practice that you can get? Oh, you know, it's, it's a million variations. You really can't even answer. I mean, okay. Okay, another way of putting, okay, another way of describing practice, which is actually the broader meaning of it all, it's not just something you do on a cushion, okay, which is when we say the word meditation, that's meaning what we mean, something on a cushion, something kind of magical, not like that. It's, this is the beginning, I said, of a process of training. So, but the broader picture is, let's say you decide you're going to become a Buddhist and how you're talking is implying you've got some kind of Buddhist practice. I mean, you could argue in one sense um, what you're trying to do as a Buddhist is familiarize yourself with Buddha's views of the re of reality. That's major part of what you're trying to do, not just watch your breath. But that's your decision. You decide when you said the Lam Rim, you said Tong Men, you said those words, right? They're all different viewpoints within the Buddhist view of how you of how you tr you you're transforming your mind from a self-centered, neurotic, deluded, out of control mind into a, a wise, compassionate, empathetic mind. And so, there's many, many things you have to familiarize your mind with. You can't just force that. So, Buddhism's got this extremely sophisticated presentation that they study in the, the Tibetan monastic university system for 20, 30 years. You know, it's all in there in this in the in the philosophical text. It's the Buddhist view of the universe, like the view of karma for a start. I mean, that's a radically different view from the materialist view of the world, isn't it? I mean, you know, the Buddha would say you don't come from mummy and daddy, which is a bit shock to us. We do, our body does, but not our consciousness, not our thoughts, not our feelings, not our emotions. And that's what he's looking at. And then we don't come from a creator, which is the only other option. You know, there's two options, basically. Your mummy and daddy created you or God created you. I mean, think about it. What else is there? I mean, are they the options in the world, sort of roughly speaking? You know, I mean, I don't want Australian Aboriginals. They've got a very sophisticated view of the world. I don't, I don't understand it, but maybe they have another view. But in general, there's either you're made by someone else or we, and we have this feeling, where do I come from? Like someone else is the source of me. Well, the Buddha says, honey child, you are the source of you because you're, and the Buddha would suggest your consciousness goes back and back and back. Now, that's a very different view. You don't just say that, oh, yeah, I believe in karma. I mean, the Buddha is saying this is what his observ observation is. This is his observation. He's not a creator. He didn't make it up. It's not revelation. He's telling us what he's observed to be true. But so you've got to then look at what's the point of thinking about that? How can that impact upon me? So you familiarize your mind with those types of attitudes and then you try to apply it in daily life. That's a huge part of practice. Do you see my point? Yeah, yeah. Do you understand? I do, yeah. Um, but that's all up to you and how much you want to study it and look at it and read about it and meditate on it and so on and so forth. Okay, is it is it better? Um, so Tonglen is more, you know, like in terms of both, like... Uh, okay, so the basically there's two wings of the bird. 
Right. I like to say the wisdom wing and the, no, I don't say it. They say it all the time. I quote it. The wisdom wing and the compassion wing. So what I'm discussing up until now is the wisdom wing, which is the nuts and bolts of how to work on your mind and for your benefit. Mm -hmm. Don't be ashamed of that. You know, you want to become a more happy, less neurotic person. This is how to do it, honey. Then because you start to open, then you start to open your eyes and realize, oh my God, we're in the same boat. You realize you want to be also empathetic and compassionate to others. So those practices are more advanced. Compassion we sound, it sounds like we like compassion, but it's much more powerful practice. You've got to first, if you like using our terminology, you've got to know yourself and have compassion for yourself first. Know yourself intimately and well, what causes you pain, what causes you your misery. Put yourself together. Then you're going to forge out compassion for other people because we're all in the same boat. Do you understand? Yeah. So this so-called Tong Len, where you actually, I mean, it's a, a powerful practice where you imagine taking upon yourself other people's suffering because you'd rather suffer than them. That's intense. I mean, that's pretty advanced, you know. Mm -hmm. So you've got to know where you're at in your practice and then you apply the different ones. Some people like different practices. Some can be very beneficial. There's a dozen different ways you can formalise all those different viewpoints, you know, in a, in a formal practice. And that's your choice in the end. Do you understand? Yes. Okay, indeed. darling. What else people? Can I ask a question? Can you oh, hear who's, me? who's I? You Where's know? the I? I Which do. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes, Zoom user, Hi. it says. I'm sorry. Yeah. You're yeah. What's Hi. your name? Uh, Sergio. Sergio. What's, really? Sergio. What's his name? Sergio. Oh, Sergios. Happy yeah. to meet you. Talk to me. Oh, hi. Hi. Listen, tell me. I know I I have heard everything you said, but how did you feel it when, when you start feeling the way you do now? As a revelation or something that was progressive into happening over years? How I don't you understand know, quite the How the, did you the, know the, what you do? How did you know what you do now? How did you start knowing what you tell me to, what you say now? This is what I think. What's his question? Yeah. I, I want to know, I want to know how, how did you happen to know what you know now? You mean me is personally, like, Rab you mean me, Rabina? Yeah, I know. Was it a revelation or was it something that... No, no, darling. In... I mean, if I'm talking to you about piano playing, you would have to deduce I've been playing the piano, wouldn't you? Yeah, I know. I know. Well, I know. Then I same understand. here, darling. Yeah, but you have a conviction that comes from a revelation. I mean, somehow what? it feels like a revelation to me. No, there's no it such feels... thing as revelation. No, that's, okay. just, that's a Christian idea that God, it comes from the sky, you know? Okay. No, okay, honey, okay. child, it comes from our mind. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a good question. Okay. Thank you. I remember asking, listen, I'll tell you a good question. Thank you. Years ago in New Zealand, in Nelson, New Zealand, one yeah. fellow, he was a scientist, and nobody has ever asked me this question before or since. He said, who revealed the teachings to the Buddha? Right. Who did? Who did? Yeah. Now, I, <laughs> Would you ask Einstein who no. revealed no. the teachings no. about relativity to him? No. And of course he laughed. So Listen, nobody nobody revealed to me my Sergio. I mean, I, I just happened to be that. And I, I know think you you can also learn to be a better version of Sergio. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. And you're doing your best, yeah? I'm trying. Good, all right. Thank you. <laughs> right. Okay. Who else? <coughs> yes. Could it be said that all emotions, without without question, without without exception, um, lead to samsara? Mm -hmm. Not only samsara. Oh. The Buddha would assert this view we're discussing here. You have neurotic. I based, fear based, constricted, distressing, disturbing states of mind. We call them attachment, anger, depression, anxiety. We're familiar, right? They make us miserable now. And this is the part that's harder to see, but as we study it, it becomes clearer because they are based on misconceptions. They're distorted. They're distorted. They they cause 
the world to appear all wrongly to us. It's obvious when you're really angry, the person looks so ugly. When you're really attached, the cake looks so divine. So when the mind is overwhelmed by these neuroses, whether they're quiet or emotional, then the world appears wrongly back to us. And then we believe in that misconception and then we keep causing more problems. So the virtuous states of mind, quiet ones or emotional, are not like that. They can only cause happiness for you and others because they're rooted in dependent arising. So when you say attachment, let's say I'm attached to you. I, I look like I love you, but I'm completely jumping on top of you, over-exaggerating your deliciousness, demanding you do what I want, possessing you as mine, obsessively thinking about you, completely neurotic. But then if I say I love you, that's virtuous, that's altruistic, that's reasonable, that connects with you. It's valid, it's virtuous, it's appropriate. It can never cause suffering. But the trouble is they come together like milk and water mix and we can't tell the difference so strong compassion and emotion or quiet compassion it can't possibly cause you suffering not possible it can only cause you more happiness and help others but the trouble is we very rarely have a virtue without a delusion our virtues are polluted by the attachment and the fears that's the tricky part yes so then we tend to often want to chuck the baby out with the bathwater. no yeah do you understand yes. yeah that's why we have to know the mind well to degrees of subtlety that are quite surprising to us. Do you understand? Yeah. I'm the chat. Yeah, yeah. Who? Hello, Lou. Hello, sweetheart. Unmute. Hi, Venerable Raina. Hi, Thank Venerable. you for teaching. Thank you. Uh, I had a question around um, essentially like how to exist in a correct way in both like formless and form settings and so I think what I mean by this is um taking care of my body and taking care of my mind um and even when I think about like the purest form of emptiness it can get quite exciting to like run away with that idea and that concept and how do you kind of balance I'm losing you a little um, bit do say it again a different way I'm losing you a bit I think basically Something I've noticed in myself, the deeper I explore my mind, is I get distracted with things that are not real world things. And so how do you get the balance right between like trying to get to the most subtle mind you can get to and still being a great citizen in oh, the okay, real world? Okay, sweetheart, listen, you can't, you know, if you're sitting in your meditation and you've got some single pointed concentration, then you can focus totally on getting to the mind being more subtle. Mm -hmm. But if you're woken up and you're driving the car and walking and talking, you can't afford to start looking at your subtle mind, sweetie pie. You're living at the grosser level, but because you've got more awareness, you can be in charge of it. So don't mix the two, you know, that would be very confusing. Unless I'm not answering your question, unless I'm not understanding your use of the words. So you, if you, when you're living, okay, you do your practice in daily life in the morning on your cushion, if you like, and then you open your eyes and then you, because you've got more control over your body and speech, you're going to be nicer to other people. You become more conscious of what's going on. You don't go up and down like a yo-yo. You literally become more in charge. And that's really the way you navigate your life. You know, you don't lose the plot. Then you go back to that the simplified. Was very helpful. Thank you. I Good. think I've been taking a little bit too seriously. The like, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I get you. So when you get home to Christmas, you, you you know you decide you leave you leave your ego at the door, and you decide you're going to be there for others, and you let all the uncle and your grandpa and your rub, your ugly old dad and your stupid old sister do and say what they like. You love them for who they are. You cut the Christmas pudding. You cut the chook and let them be happy. Okay, and then you walk out the door again. How about that? Sounds terrific. Okay, darling. We call I also have a question. Australians call chickens chooks. You have can, I, can I ask another question? Okay, go. Please. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned a little bit earlier is like you, there's this perception that your mind is getting worse, right? Because you're more aware of That's right. some of the That's thoughts it. you're having. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have any practical tips on, you know, noticing sad thoughts or frustrating thoughts or, um, and how to respond to them with 
wisdom. with wisdom and not like yeah in your own self you mean your own stuff yes yeah, so sure when don't. i notice that i mean I'm sure of course the, yeah of course listen i mean this the the level to which we are capable of controlling the mind is really so advanced it's almost like a joke to talk about it but as long as we know we can in the long term then we have to be prepared to deal with the chaos now so as long as we know there's potential there you know maybe you just your first time you hit the racket and be, the difference between that and playing Wimbledon is kind of big you know so you know there's the potential is the point so you start somewhere so the chaos in the beginning is incredible you really think you're definitely getting worse there's no question but you're not so part of there's a multitude of approaches and one of the approaches is when you hear the thoughts running rampant, one of the key things is you treat them a bit like kind of some crazies out by your front door, all shouting and yelling about you. You let them shout and yell, but you don't believe every word they say. I can't tell you how profound this practice is. We tend to believe whatever arises in our mind, especially when it's about me. Always, we can't help that. So when the mind's a bit distressed or a bit angry, a bit jealous, Try and observe the thoughts, but don't identify with them. This is a miracle of a practice, sweetheart. You let them come and you let them go. This is huge. But learn while you're listening. Learn. You know, there's anger, there's jealousy, there's depression. It's very hard because we tend to identify with them. We run from pillar to post, up and down like a yo-yo, you know. So this is a really powerful practice. Not to think, oh, they shouldn't be there, not to be guilty, not to wish they weren't there. Just let them come and let them go. It's a huge practice, you know. And also have positive thoughts. I mean, you can bring out your good roommates. I mean, I always joke and say the bad roommates tend to run the show, but you can bring up the good ones. They're under the mattress and in the wardrobe. Bring them out. Say some positive thoughts. Argue with the crazies. Do you understand? That's another approach. Yes, thank you. Thank good. you very much. Yeah. All right. What else? Okay, yes, Sydney. Talk to me. Sydney. So you're saying that, so say like throughout my day, whatever, like today, actually, I was vacuuming and I, you know, spiraled into negativity as I do. So okay. instead of believing the negative thoughts and the story I was telling myself, like I did, mm -hmm. I could look at them and realize that's the patterns that I'm having that are causing me trouble. That's it. That's Take right. distance from them and say like, oh, watch this untrue story that I'm just like yeah I mean yeah my head. I think it's important you know sometimes um you know let's say something goes wrong on the outside and the person doesn't answer you properly and you freak out and start going to this panic attack they don't love me and oh my god what did I do wrong that kind of thing I mean you know it's like or just your thoughts uncontrolled when they're not controlled you just learn you try to listen and if there is some truth there then learn from the truth and change but if not and because the irony of the negative ones is they always exaggerate they're always exaggerating this is the point they exaggerate you know and that's and so it's really to see how they exaggerate and to, and to learn just to let the crazy thoughts go and notice it. Have a part of you, a virtuous part of you, like your kind roommate saying, come on, Rabina, give it a break. It's all right, sweetheart. You know, back off. It's okay. You kind of have this dialogue. You're trying to be reasonable. Do you understand, Sydney? Yeah, I do. Thank I mean, you. it's not an easy job. This is nonstop, you know. But it's possible. The my, I mean, as Lama Zopa says, we can mould our mind into any shape we like. You know, we've got to have this confidence really have this confidence but we tend to believe whatever arises we we'll all believe in the conspiracy theories i mean look at the world you know as soon as we hear anything kind of anybody's mouth we believe it so we believe our own rubbish as well it's kind of crazy yeah what else people what time is it what time is it Oh, another half an hour. Okay, go. Oh, yes, talk to me. In other words, like look at your thoughts instead of thinking them, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, we can't help but think them, but observe them, not yeah, not swim right. inside them, not sink right. into them, not right. buy into the story. Exactly, it's very you beneficial. Buy it. Exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. Not buy into the story. Yeah. That's right. Yes, exactly. I mean, yeah. See this view back to this view of karma. It's a huge one, really. 
I mean, that's why I like to use this example. I use an extreme example. I use this example because sometimes when we hear about karma, it just sounds like a nice, a kind of interesting philosophical view. What's it got to do with the price of fish? What's it got to do with life? Why should I care, you know? So who cares if my consciousness comes from before? Who cares there's no creator? Who cares my mind doesn't come from my mummy? We, we, we would tend to think as if that doesn't have a, and as if those views don't play a role in our lives. Well, the Buddhist approach is the more we look into the way we respond to things, the, the, the irony of ego is it's, it's not being mean now, is we, are, we, we feel like an innocent victim. Look at how we feel. We say, but I didn't ask to get born. It's not my fault. We say like that. Or have a look at when a really uh, bad thing happens. One of the sh our shocking response often, a shocking response is, but how, how dare that happen to me? You know, This should not have happened. And we would even say, I don't deserve it. Hear those words. Those words are very real. I think the way we suffer so badly when bad things happen in life is based on these views, you know. So we take those views as a given, don't we? I didn't ask to get born. It isn't my fault. I have done nothing to deserve that. Why did that happen to me? It's very deeply ingrained in our, in our being. Well, the Buddha's analysis will be is because we have those philosophical viewpoints deep in the bones of our being. We have a viewpoint that's so primordial, we don't even think it's a viewpoint. So that's why I like to use this extreme example of these young Tibetan nuns. I always tell this story. I must have told it a thousand times. In New York years ago, 2003, Richard Gere invited his holiness, the Dalai Lama. And he also decided to invite a bunch of former prisoners. So like 20 former prisoners, all of whom had done some kind of meditation in prison. Because I was working with people in prison at the time in California, I was invited to with some other people. And it was a very moving day. <laughs> they all talked about their suffering, you know, black, white, Puerto Rican, Mexican, political prisoners, blah, 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 whatever, male, female, cross-section of Americans, right? I'm talking about their suffering. And they met the Dalai Lama. It was a lovely time. They had a lovely time. But he also invited two young Tibetan nuns. So these young women, <laughs> they were young, young, I don't know, 20s, had been sexually abused and tortured for a couple of years in uh, Tibet. And they were talking about their experiences, right, their suffering. So I think, you know, what was evident to the Americans, who are typical Ameri Americans, meaning people like me, you, who have views not not like the view of karma, the view are the creator, or your mother and father made you, or you don't quite know where you came from, and you didn't ask to get born anyway, no matter what. And so somehow a sense of, you know, life's all just good luck and bad luck, and no one's got an understanding of it, and why do bad things happen, and why do good things happen, no one knows. We tend to have this fatalistic view, right? Unless you've got a view of a creator, which of course is a very strong one. And that's fine. But the thing is, these young women having the view of karma. So you've, you've got to realize that for, this view is something that's been around in India for 5,000 years, 4,000 years. It was first articulated by the genius Indians who, due to their own subtle level of mind, are able to see the past and the present, which is completely common in this view of the mind, has this powerful capacity, much stronger capacity for cognition of more subtle phenomena than we would posit in the materialist world. That's a given, right? So these young women brought up since, you know, like seventh century in India, in Tibet, karma has just been in the bones of their being. I mean, in the same way that in our world, you forget if you're a Christian or Muslim, but the materialist philosophical view of the universe, that your mother and father, that your body is the brain, that your body is physical, that you've got a brain, that's your mind, there's nothing else, and your mummy and daddy, mummy, daddy, grandma, grandpa, back to the monkeys. That's how we track ourselves, isn't it? That's the view that prevails. That's the view that we take as a given. That's the view we assume is a truth. Okay. So these young women, that's not their view. They've never heard that view. They've heard the view of karma, which, you know, not the creative view. They don't have that view. 
may have a view since they're born and it's been in that culture for since the seventh century that consciousness is not physical everybody's mind goes back and back and back to past lives everything you think and do and say programs you and produces the person you become whatever happens to you now is the fruit of what you've done before whatever you do now produces the person you become this is just implicit in their mind it's, it's just in it's it's in their mind in the bones of their being as a given because that's what they've been programmed with. that's what they've studied practiced lived according to put it like that so these young women being tortured and sexually abused. So it was fairly evident, I'd say, to the Americans that these young women, if you wanted to quantify suffering, it was probably worse than everybody else's. But on the other hand, it was clear that they weren't angry. This is a massive discussion, you know. This is very fascinating. They weren't, in other words, what, what weren't they experiencing? They weren't saying, how dare that happen to us we don't deserve it. That is the voice of anger. That is the philosophical position of anger, this outrage, this shock. How dare that happen to me? Or if we see it on the outside, how dare that happen to those people? They don't deserve it. So that, I think that is the philosophy of anger. It's a conceptual story deep in our mind. So that doesn't come from any, that doesn't come from nowhere. For the Buddha, that's in built into us. It's part of this view of the universe that he would call the samsaric philosophical view that he would suggest is completely mistaken view of the world. Don't believe him, but look into it. You know, he might be a load of rubbish, might be talking nonsense. He says, don't believe a single word I'm telling you. So these young women had that view of karma, meaning they have an explanation in their own mind of why they were raped and tortured. They have an explanation of why these bad things were happening, but they also have an explanation of why good things happen. Right? Hello. So this is the, huh? Hello. Oh, I'm Hi. not finished yet. Wait. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. No, don't okay. be sorry. Just because I gave okay. it one breath, he jumped I'm in. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. I'm not don't sorry. Don't be sorry, darling. It's all right. <laughs> I'm trying to finish the whole story, then you can ask yeah. the question. Okay. So the point is, these young women. Having the view of karma in their bone is the basis of their practice. So this is also the point that's kind of powerful. At the end of telling their story, they were sad. And one of them, there were tears. And one of them said, and of course, we had compassion for our torturers because we know we must have harmed them in the past. And... More crucially, because we know that they will suffer in the future. So we take this view of karma, billions of sentient beings, billions of minds, every millisecond we are experiencing the fruit of our past programming, and every millisecond we are producing our future experiences. This is the view, you know, which is a very, very powerful concept. Very, very powerful. So then with that view, if you're trying to apply it in your daily life, you would take responsibility for good, uh, all the good things and all the bad things. Now, it's uh, our trouble is because we are so have so much attachment, emotional hunger to get the good things. When good things happen, nobody ever says, "Now, why do good things happen to me? Just give me more, please." Because you know why? With bad things, we believe we don't deserve it and with good things we believe we deserve so this dualistic view of deserve and miss and not deserve buddha says we make it up it's a completely dualistic view that we have made up he's saying so this view of karma is really quite subtle you know it's an incredibly it's based on an incredibly powerful view that consciousness is a continuous continuity is a mental moments every millisecond of whatever any being thinks and says and does produces the future and everything you experience now all the good and the bad is the fruit of your own past programming so when you take a broad view like that then you would have that view as those young tibetan nuns did which is pretty intense you know so it goes quite deep so karma is not just some interesting concept you plonk on top or think it's irrelevant the, the whole view the Buddha presents about what he means by samsara, just his word for this philosophical view of ego, you know, that, that has these views and misconceptions, and this is what produces our suffering. So it's quite a long-term kind of perspective, you know, quite subtle. So go on then to me. Um, Hi, Rubina. Yep, go. Hi. Hey, yep. listen, I, I, you, you kind of answer my question, but at the same time, I say, for example, you know, talking about what's happening in Palestine and, yes. and Israel, you know, 
I mean, the suffering of so many people. Terrible. You yes, know, that's right. Like, how how can that be that you know that all that people deserve this suffering? Like you're talking about three, five, seven million people. You know how is that I possible? I mean, okay, yeah, I know, but how? I understand. But at the same time, in this moment in in our history and in this moment in our world, can you please take move away from Israel and Palestine right the second and go in your mind to another place where there's villages and people are harmonious and there's money in the bank and the children go to school every day and the food is delicious and the sun is shining and there's no bombs and there's no gangsters, but we don't ask question, why does that happen? We only ask why the bad but there's good as well and there's all the fruit of all of us, seven million or one million or one. Because we do things together, so we experience the fruits together. So when we have this view no, of just bad that's things, true. it becomes much more kind of humble and much more optimistic and much more encouraging. And then we get more power. You know, all I can say is from the time I first heard the view of karma, I mean, I just happened to like it. What can I tell you, you know, since I first yeah. heard it? For me, I felt like yeah. I was missing. And for right. me, it's very powerful because it helps you take responsibility and yeah, then yeah, you yeah. can have compassion. That, that's very good, Robina. You know what? I, I feel that, you know, like privilege is always invisible to the person that is being privileged. You I know? understand. And there, there you go. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Thank you, darling. Very kind. Anyway, it's a big top. It's a massive one, but it's like, it's a massive one. And I like talking about it. I find it very, very useful view to have. It, I mean, I joke about it, but I mean it because it means I'm responsible. I'm the boss. I don't want to be the victim of anybody, thank you. My happiness or my suffering. I'm the boss, baby. I like that view. I tell you. Wow. What else, Bimo? Talk to me, somebody. Yeah. There are different uh, views of the different Buddhist schools. Yeah, that's right. Um, on when... Um, Karma ripens. What do you mean by different views in Buddhist yeah. schools on when karma ripens? What do you mean by that? There are some schools that believe that uh, maybe karma, karma would ripen within a lifetime. Oh, I see what you're saying. No, no. Say, no, generally speaking, no, no. I see what you're saying. No, it's a bit like, no, there probably might be, but I would say it's not a question of schools. It's just a question of interpretation. But basically, the kind, the view of karma, I think like this. If you look at a garden today, today, you know that what is ripening didn't wasn't planted yesterday. You know it must have been years before, if not months before. Do you understand? But you also know that whatever pruning you do and the watering you do can help nourish what's there. It's just that's our life. So you come into this life programmed. At the time you passed away, in fact, a few weeks before you found your mother's way to your mummy's fallopian tube, your one of your virtuous karmic seeds of non-killing was triggered that already programmed you to go to your present mother's womb, one. Two, all the karmic seeds that were producing your personality and you were born with those from the first, second of conception, all those tendencies, they were triggered at the same time as your death. Three, all the karmic seeds that were produced in this life, all your experiences at the hands of others, how they see and hear you and treat you, hate you, love you, kill you, whatever. And then four, even the way the physical environment impacts upon you, all those seeds were triggered even before you stopped breathing in the past life. And then when you found your way to your mother's fallopian tube, then that's the beginning of this person. You are who now. So everything in this life is playing out those karmic seeds and some could be planted a million lives ago. But whatever you do in this life can help nourish some of those, hasten the bad ones, hasten the good ones. I mean, but you don't just, what you do, to, in other words, what the killing you do today won't produce results of killing for maybe for 27 lifetimes. If you maybe kill your mother, they say, a very heavy negative action, that could ripen in this life. Maybe you just get killed, you know. But very rarely, mostly what we experience in this life is from seeds we planted in the past. Mostly what we do in this life is seeds we planted in the past, but they all influence each other nevertheless. But it's, just, it's sort of like a garden, really. It's not just instant karma. No such thing as instant karma, basically. Roughly speaking like that, Okay. Thank yeah, you. yeah, okay. I mean, it's in it's in the text in the in the Indian text, you know, from there's like masses 
on this literature on, on the view of karma. It's hugely complex. And it's, again, it's coming from the experiences of these great yogis who've gone to these subtle levels of meditation. Because this is the fundamental point about the mind, which is utterly different from the neuroscientific view, that consciousness is not physical, and it's got these much subtler levels of cognition. This is, It's like, you know, it just these levels of mind simply are not posited in neuroscience. There are marvelous people all discussing all these things now. Dalai Lama and all his mob having all these discussions with the scientists, and they're looking into all of these views now, which is fantastic. I mean, we're beginning to realize in the white modern scientific world, if you see what I'm saying, the European view of the world that it's not just goes back to the Greeks, but these Indians and these Asians and these Africans. That, guess what? Have a few ideas. We may be learning that in our humility, getting a bit humble in our world, all the modern thinkers. You understand what I'm saying, people? Yeah. I, I think I'm actually more confused now. More confused. I'm so sorry. It's not a, it's not a new karma. Okay, go on. But when you were reflecting on how you like it because it gives you responsibility, I was having trouble finding the place where I feel anything but kind of along for the ride. And so even when I'm at my best. Yeah, I understand. When do I get to... Okay, when you've, you really get to, in, to be in control when you realize emptiness. But until then, we can still practice virtue and have a conscious decision. You can still practice virtue. You are along for the ride because all the seeds are there, but you're able to work with what's there in a much better way. Don't you see? I mean, can you see that you've learned to get more control? You can learn to be yeah. consciously more compassionate I think it's right. It's so when I'm when I'm in uh, a present state, when I see things clearly, and yeah, I act naturally. Yes, I'm still acting within some karma. Oh, you're karma. acting within dependent. No, karma's dependent arising. Yeah, it's just dependent arising. That garden you are gardening in this moment at that on that flower right now. But those flowers and those trees and those oak trees come from a great big fat past, honey child. Yeah. So the moment is the moment, but it's, it's based upon what you've been in the past. You can't, that's dependent on rising. So being in charge now means you're able to access being present because you're practicing and then you're, and you're nourishing your virtuous seeds every second. But it's still a, part, a process of dependent on rising. You can't argue with that. It can't just be not dependent on rising. There's no such thing. Do you see? Good. Okay. What else, people? Yeah. What, darling? The nuns. The who? The nuns that you were talking about. Those Tibetan about. nuns, yeah. Yes. So they they were tortured, sexually abused by prison guards. You have you have said before that karma is very personal. Of course it is. Totally, yeah. God, yeah. So that in the past, their, the, the karma that they experienced at the hands of the guards were because, precisely because they had... That's what they said. Okay. Now, if... Now, in the future, though, if they don't, if the if the nuns did not respond, did no, they had compassion? They forgave, would, had compassion. Would then so they they did? Would that not? Would that end it right there? That karma end what, darling? Yeah, of course you can end. That's the whole point about it. You've got to learn to end your karma, don't you? That's when so you realize they, it. They huh? end the guards' karma. Of course you don't. How can you do that? Well, if they if they don't respond, because... but they still got they still got their mind and their delusions and their problems and their anger and their depression. What are you talking about? So just because you don't hit me in return doesn't mean you fix my anger. Come on, that particular... I'm still anger. Okay. okay, okay. I mean, it's more simple. It's more complex than oh, suddenly you fix it because I fixed my bit. But you can only work on your bit. Mm -hmm. right. You can only work on your bit and fix your bit. That's the whole point. And that's our trouble. In our culture, we figure until I you forgive me and I can't change. But you can do your own thing completely and clean it up and realize emptiness and get the hell out of samsara when it is running around killing each other. Right. That's the point. Right. The dynamic changes, obviously. Mm -hmm. The dynamic is there still, but it changes, it shifts. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Do you understand? What? Yes. Question from Sydney. Yeah. Go Sydney. So, be, so then could it be said because our mental, our mind, our experience of our mind is based on our past, like habits and our karma. Yeah. And our experience in the external world is based on our karma. Is that how? Yes. Is that why they like we're dependent arisings? 
Absolutely. Everything is dependent arising. Everything is existing yeah. in dependence upon something else. Nothing exists in isolation. Nothing can exist without depending on something. It's just the way things are. Do you see, Sydney? I Do you think understand? so, yeah. Go on, just keep talking. I, I don't know. It's just, that's just like a big thing to accept that, like, oh, like it, I'm not inherent. It's actually because of something that happened in the past and everything. I've like what this mind has been building for so long. But I mean, isn't that typical? I mean, but when you're playing the piano and I just hear you for the first time, I can go, "Wow, Sydney's been playing for 27 years." It's fairly obvious. You're you're playing the piano now. Does not exist in isolation of your past practice. How could it possibly? Yeah, it couldn't. That doesn't make any sense. That's exactly right. Nothing. Everything is depend. We tend to have a gut feeling that things kind of like, where did it all begin with an absolute B beginning? So as the Dalai Lama says in one time with all his talks with his scientists, he says, Big Bang, no problem. Just not the first Big Bang, that's all. You understand? Somehow, and it sort of infuriates us. We want to pin everything down. There's the first moment. There's the beginning, you know. Things are dependent arising. Things are big continuity of moments. It's very subtle. Obviously, it's very subtle, you know. Do you understand, Sydney? Yeah, I think so. A little bit. Good enough. Me, me too. A little bit. <laughs> what else, people? Come on. Time to go home. What a cute fan. Look at the fans. They're so cute. <laughs> you chose well, George. Got good, got good taste. <laughs> what else, people? Come on. Questions? Keep an eye on the clock for me. Okay. Look at a nice song. That's beautiful. Lovely song, Carpa. Look at you. Okay, go on. Talk to me, people. Quarter of an hour. Uh, it, where? Uh, Rubina, yes. Rubina. Oh, oh, no, wait a minute. Rubina. Hang on, honey. You, Hang on, honey. Wait, 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 wait. We've got a couple okay. more people here. Wait, sweetie. Go. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned the ego, like this victim mentality. Big what? The ego. This is a very rough ego. word, and all the yeah. voices of ego are like attachment and anger and jealousy and so all the drama queens. Yes. Well, darling, our karma means that whatever you are is what you put it there. All the weeds in the garden, because you planted them. All the flowers in your garden, because you planted them. They wouldn't be there if you'd pulled them out. Yeah, but so that's something that happened in the past, and I'm experiencing it now. And if I'm aware of that, yes. but I still have to like pay the karma. No, you just have to change. You pull out the weeds before they ripen, sweetie. Be very clever. You don't wait till all the weeds ripen. You pull them out first. You get ahead of the game. All kinds of practices help you. They call it purification. Lots of those practices we have. You can put atomic bombs under all the habits before they get too strong. Possible. Very encouraging. Okay. Thank you. All right. You even, I mean, you think about it, you know, every time, wait, wait. No okay. more. You All wait. Right. Mute yourself. He's always sorry as well. Um, <laughs> I'm not sorry. I know. <laughs> uh, you see, you can think, like, if, say, what you're feeling a bit angry and then someone kind of, you can have one moment of kindness. That's like an atomic bomb on anger. So just have to sit there. I mean, just a moment of making effort not to be angry is very powerful purification. You know, every time you play, you keep making the same mistake on the piano and you make a real effort to keep playing it right. That's a very powerful antidote to playing it wrong. So even every moment, just being kind, being patient is antidote to the opposite. So we're always purifying in a way, you know, it's very dynamic. Do you understand? So be optimistic about it. Yes, you'd better talk to me before you bubble up and burst. Come on, what is it? I'm sorry. Hey, listen, no, I'm not sorry. But <laughs> do you like, do you like? What? He froze. What's he saying? Music? He's frozen. What, dear? No. Do you like music? I'm a jazz fan. Oh, I see. Yeah. Like who? Like who, for example? Good. He's a funny fella. <laughs> now you can mute yourself again. Go on, who else? Here you go. A bit louder, sweetie. My question is not really a question, but I just like to say Would you say that um, that awareness or that, that being awareness of, of being and seeing um, the thoughts does that that intelligence on its own does it have the power to bring up creative solutions to the problem? It's a very esoteric question. Why don't you ask me again? 
Yeah. What do you um, mean by this? That awareness. What awareness, darling? Um, of, of your thoughts. Okay, so there you are watching your thoughts. It's a very particular little practice. Yes. Then the question is, yes. yeah. Does that, does that yeah. Sweetie Pie, no. mute. Mute yourself, darling. Thank you. He's done it now. Go on, go. Okay. So no, no, see, that's a very particular practice. If you're, you know, if you're watching carefully your mind, that's not very creative. You're just trying to watch your mind. Yes, but does, does that bring about a creative power to deal with whatever is in front of you? Creative or, power. It sounds to, so dramatic. To, Sweetheart, listen, listen, to, listen. Sorry. If you observe, if you're playing the piano, I have to use the ordinary examples. Yeah. So you've got your theories in your mind and on the piece of paper there is Bach's music written showing you what to play, right? So you have the theories. You've got Buddha's views. If you're studying Buddha's view, it's like there for you. You've got the concepts. You understand what the mind is. You observe, you know how what anger is. You know what jealousy is. You know what love is. So using that intelligence to watch your mind. So you identify with what's there. You can, no, sorry, you identify what is there, but you have to have the theory in your mind first. First. It doesn't come, it doesn't come, you know, you can't just go, oh, there's B flat. You've got to check Bach's music first. It's a model you're using to use to refer to what's in your mind. So you have the basis of intelligence, which is there's anger, there's jealousy, there's love, there's kindness. It's intelligence that you're using, not just idiocy, not just watching mindlessly. Mindfulness is sometimes mindfulness or just a being aware is very good. But if you keep, if you, if you like a, another example, if you're watching your garden, you've got really good mindfulness of your garden. You can have, you can do it really well and you can even replicate it in the picture, couldn't you? But if you don't know how to identify the weeds and the herbs, what good is it? Sometimes it's good just to observe, but finally you have to know the difference between a weed and a herb so you know to grow the herb and to pull out the bloody weed. It's got to be, the mindfulness has to be imbued with intelligence. Are you with me? Good. Um... Yeah. Yes, go, Lou. Venerable, I just had a question if there's something that you really wish this group of people to learn from you today like is there something in your heart that you're like really really want us to understand come on sweetie pie you tell me what you think from what you heard you can hear me what do you think come on that's a everybody's going to get so everybody's going to get something i think understanding to be like just to be practice as many moments of the day as you can play the that's piano a good, that's a good thing to, that's a good takeaway Definitely. That's a good takeaway. I agree with that. I, enough? Good I, enough? I, I think the more direct question I was going to ask is you talked about understanding direct perception of emptiness, and I just, I feel ignorant about that. But, I know, that'll be another a, We'll do that another day. All right? Sounds good. Another day, darling. We'll do that one. I think it's time to finish now. More questions? Yes, sweetheart. So... Is everything that we experience, bit louder, darling. Is everything that we experience then a result of a something a, before? See that we planted. How could it not be? So put it that way. So then, do we not really have free will? Um, for some reason, everybody thinks is a thing called free will, and we all quote it like it's a scientific finding. Well, with respect, we should give it its appropriate source. I'm not being rude, but it comes from Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ tells us that God, when he made us, he gave us this thing called free will. We humans. Meaning, but when I when I take that view from the perspective of Buddhism, how, to say free will, you have to tell me, because you use the term. So please tell me what you mean by free will. Will, I have no problem. What do you mean by free? That's the big problem. What do you mean by free will? I think I think about it in the present moment. I have the ability to do whatever I want. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Right there. Stop, stop. 
So you have the ability to choose whatever you want. To think it or do it or what? Oh, I see. So you have the ability right now because you think it to go and play Wimbledon. The second, do you? Really? I see. That's interesting. And then check the last time you chose to be depressed. Check the last time you chose to be angry. So free was a bit of nonsense that I put. Whatever's there, I mean, how can there be anything that arises in a garden that isn't the fruit of what was put there before? How can anything exist in front of you that doesn't have some kind of past? How can anything in your mind just come out of nowhere and it doesn't contradict choice? That's the point. But depending on what's how very strong. Like if anger is a really strong tendency in your mind because you've practiced it lots, when you hear that patience is a good idea, you'll think what a stupid idea and keep being angry. So you hardly do it out of free will, baby. You do it out of habit. But you, if you've got the ability to hear, well, that's an interesting thought. I haven't thought about patience before. That has to mean that is in there somewhere and it just you nourished it. So now you can begin to nourish it. And so it's an intelligence that we've got that the many things can arise in our mind and we have to learn to have some objectivity and wisdom to decide, you know. And sometimes deciding is quite difficult. Gates in is kind of the support for Trump in the MAGA world already. Who's talking? Who's that talking? It should be pointed out, I think when you pay out a billion dollars, you get a little bit more cautious about the things that go on your head. It turns out. Um, are they talking to me or each other? I don't know. Anyway, are we communicating a little bit? It's a little bit more complex than that, I'd suggest. But the, the 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 irony is, as soon as we hear that whatever we do has come from before, we think it paralyzes us. But we don't worry about gardens. No one worries about the uh, hack. What do you mean? I've got no choice to, to to grow a rose just because a rose comes from the past. It doesn't contradict. We tend to think it does. Enough. Enough for now. Yeah. Good night to Soma Sama Sankarpa. There's Lama Sankarpa. Look at that. Okay, so we think it 40 minutes, 90 minutes, whatever it was. Food for thought. Keep moving, developing our amazing potential. Take what works for us. Have confidence in our marvelous potential. That's the big one. That's the one to take away. Have potential, have confidence in our incredible potential. That'll keep us buoyant. Then we can, you know, then we can navigate what comes and keep remembering that. Otherwise we sink, you know. And we delight that all these seeds we've planted, there's nothing that's gone astray these 90 minutes. There's nothing that disappears in one ear and out the other. It's all gone in. So we think we're going to nourish these seeds from this moment forward so we can develop our amazing potential, so we can be a benefit to others. Jung chob sem chog rin poche ma kie panam ke gyo chig kie pan yam pa me pa yang gong ne gong du pel ba shog. I never give up, people. That's it. Done for the prayers. Good night, everybody. Thank Good you, Gela. Good night. Thanks, Thank sweetheart. Bye.